Okay, so hello, good day everyone. Welcome to Bridgem Indonesia webinar in collaboration with Mentari Program, UK Government Support for Indonesian Renewable Energy Projects. I am Asti, Events Coordinator at Bridgem Indonesia. And our speaker for today's session are Mike Crosetti, the Co-Director of Mentari Program, and Iwan Adisa Putra, Brokerage Strand Lead of Mentari Program. And our moderator for today's session is Yonatan Wijaya, Head of Private Sector Engagement at the British Embassy Jakarta. And before we start, allow me to review the functionality of this Zoom webinar. Today's webinar is being recorded and we will be able to share a link with you when it's available after this webinar is completed. All the in participants will be muted to avoid background noises that may distract you from listening to this webinar and also to enable our speakers to present without interruption. And if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box at any time. And we will have time for a Q&A session at the end to answer your questions. Okay, now without further ado, I'm going to hand the screen over to Anne Sliman, Chairman of Bridgem Indonesia, to open today's webinar. Thank you. And a special welcome to the UK Ambassador to Indonesia and Timor-Leste, Owen Jenkins. Um, I'd like to express my appreciation to the British Embassy team responsible for the Mentari program in putting together this, this webinar, which will focus on the UK government's support for Indonesian renewable energy. Mentari is part of the UK Prosperity Fund, which aims to reduce poverty through stimulating inclusive economic growth in middle income countries. One of the focus areas is to support Indonesia's transition to a low carbon economy which would obviously include a substantial renewable energy component. Uh, I had a sneak preview of, of some of the presentation and I see there's quite a bit of focus on the eastern part of Indonesia. Um, and although the UK is many thousands of miles away from Indonesia, the UK actually uh, shares some similarities, particularly in the more remote areas and the islands. Historically in the UK we've had issues uh, with depopulation, um, we have had issues with the high cost of fuel as a, as a percentage of disposable income. Fortunately, um, in recent years, through a significant amount of in innovation, um, some very good supporting regulation and deregulation, many of these issues in the UK have been addressed. So I think the UK is in a, a very unique position to partner with Indonesia in a program like this. Um, many of you listening uh, are involved in the renewable energy sector, and I think it would be fair to say that whilst Indonesia has tremendous renewable energy resources, we have often been frustrated about the, the lack of traction and the lack of progress in developing many of the renewable energy uh, resources here. Uh, so I think it's very good that the British Embassy has developed this program, which can act as a catalyst, both in terms of advocacy support, uh, possibly helping out with financing or facilitating that, and just general support for, for uh, British industry in this sector. So I would encourage everyone who's interested in this sector to get in touch with the Embassy team to learn more about the Mentari program after this. Hopefully today, the overview will be very illuminating for everyone. Um, I would now like to hand over to today's moderator, who as Asti said, is Jonathan Lejaya, who's head of private sector engagement at the British Embassy. He's been with the Embassy for three years. And I believe, Jonathan, most of your time has been focused on, on the energy sector. Prior to that, he worked in the private sector, principally with uh, Salim Chemical Group. So Jonathan, a warm welcome to you and your colleagues. I'll leave it for you to, to do the formal introductions to your colleagues, and I look forward to participating in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ensley. Uh, good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Welcome again to uh, our webinar for Mantari program. 
UK government support for Indonesia Renewable Energy Project. I'm Yonatan Wijaya, the moderator for today. So as a scene setter, uh, we know that Indonesia has huge potential for renewable energy. Uh, the estimate is actually 400 gigawatts. Probably you, you saw it uh, in the flyer. There was a, a slight typo. It was supposed to be 400 gigawatts, which is a conservative estimate. Some of uh, the estimates were in the range of 100 gigawatts or 700 gigawatts. To put it in context, uh, President Jokowi uh, electric, electricity program was only 35 gigawatts. So you can imagine that uh, the whole potential of renewable energy could actually help to fulfill that. Uh, of course, uh, for us in the industry, there were some factors, some obstacles that probably frustrates us that uh, the renewable energy sector is not developing as quickly as we want. So uh, on this uh, point of view, the UK government would like to help Indonesia as well to the Mantari program, uh, which we aim to eventually help the sector to grow and to help Indonesia to fulfill its ambition in renewable energy and also in reducing its carbon emission. Uh, together with me today will, is our uh, ambassador, uh, Pak Owen Jenkins, which will deliver the opening remarks later, and also our uh, panelists from the implementer of the Mentari program. Uh, we have uh, Pak Mike Corsetti, the director of Castle Rock Consulting, an energy and infrastructure consulting firm, uh, which with offices in Singapore and Jakarta. He has been based in Jakarta for the past 25 years, working with governments, multi and bilateral development agencies state-owned enterprises and private companies on energy sector challenges in Indonesia and throughout Southeast Asia. Mike was previously an energy planner at the World Bank and a partner in PA Consulting Group. Also, we have with us today Pak Iwan Adisaputra, which is from Castle Rock Consulting as well, part of our implementer consortium. Pak Iwan has 30 years uh, experience in the energy sector and corporate finance infrastructure. Prior to joining Castle Rock, he was working in a multinational company and responsible for project development and structuring, corporate finance, and dealing with government regulation in various infrastructure companies. He has also led several projects such as assignment to help the government of Indonesia establish the Public-Private Partnership Central Unit, or PPCU, PPR Investor Guide for PPP Infrastructure in Indonesia, assisted PLN Geothermal with formulation of its corporate strategy, and also prepared a geothermal pricing policy for NEMR or uh, Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources and also assist the provincial government of Aceh to strengthen the capacity of tender committee for Shiolawa Agam Jatama project. So Pak Iwan is now the brokerage trend lead for our Mentai program and Pak Mark Korsati is actually our co-director for the uh, Mentai program. Apologies again for the technical problem and the connections uh, difficulties but I will also send out the uh, excerpt of uh, HMA's uh, address today to everyone, so uh, you can read uh, the points, the important points that you would like to deliver uh, to all of us. Thank you again, Pa Owen. Uh, now we'll go straight to our uh, topic of the day, which is the Mentari program. I uh, would like to hand it over to Pa Mike and Pa Iwan uh, to present about the program and also especially about uh, how the private sector, how companies, how projects can get involved. If you have questions, please do uh, put your questions in the uh, Q&A. I will read it later for uh, our discussion. Pak Iwan and Pak Mike, time is yours. Good, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Iwan, you'll be handling the slides. Good, thank you. Um, so I'll provide a brief overview of the Mentari program. And then I'll turn it over to uh, Iwan, uh, who is our brokerage strand lead. My name is Mike Crosetti. I'm one of the co-directors uh, from Castle Rock, part of the consortium for implementing the Mentari program on behalf of the UK government. Um, you can go straight on to that first. There we go. Good. Thank you, Iwan. Um, I think as uh, Ainsley mentioned at the beginning and as uh, part of what the ambassador said that came through is that Mentari is actually funded under the UK Prosperity Fund. 
which is a bit different from a lot of other programs, uh, bilateral and multilateral, that aim to promote renewable energy, and that it's taking the approach of looking at how renewable energy can actually help to reduce poverty and stimulate inclusive economic growth. The uh, Prosperity Fund in general uh, looks to promote economic reforms, build strong institutions, and reform key sectors. And as part of that, uh, the Prosperity Fund programs typically rely on very strong private sector involvement, both from international companies and in particular from UK-based companies. And Iwan will be talking more about some of those initiatives or, or activities under the Mentari program that seek to uh, provide private sector opportunities. I'm sure that'll be of interest to a lot of you on the call today. Uh, Indonesia is a high uh, priority country for the UK government because of uh, Indonesia's uh, growth prospects in the coming years, but also because Indonesia still has, despite the uh, economic prospects for the country, there still are a lot of disparities throughout the country economically uh, and regionally. Um, and also, Indonesia is one of the larger uh, greenhouse gas emitters in the world. So hopefully, through the Mentari program, we can address both of these uh, issues, the greenhouse gas emissions, as well as some of these uh, economic inequities. So the Mentari program began earlier this year. It's a four-year program. It'll run through 2023. And as Ainsley, Ainsley mentioned uh, earlier at the outset of the webinar, that we are focusing on Eastern Indonesia, and that is because that is a region of Indonesia that has perhaps some of the greatest economic disparities and where uh, we would really like to focus a lot of these economic development activities uh, for the communities in that part of the country. But we are looking at uh, policy actions, we're looking at project opportunities throughout the country and so uh, it, it's not a unique focus to just Eastern Indonesia, but it is one area that we are looking at in, in more detail than the rest of the country. The uh, program consists of four main areas of focus or what we call strands. Um, the first is around uh, policy and, and regulatory development and building the skills within government to properly regulate the sector. By creating a better policy environment, hopefully we can create a better business environment and be able to realize the sorts of investments that will help achieve the objectives of the program. We also want to demonstrate uh, the application of some of these policy concepts and some of these uh, models for <clears throat> off-grid supply and how they can deliver better economic incomes for uh, outcomes for uh, uh, rural communities. So the second strand is a demonstration strand. The third strand of the program is around awareness and knowledge sharing. And here we're looking to uh, both share some of the lessons learned from the program, but also to draw in experience internationally from UK institutions, UK universities, uh, and, and others in Indonesia that can help strengthen the delivery of the program. And then finally, the fourth strand is to facilitate financing. And basically what this means is we want to make private sector projects happen. Uh, we'll be working on both the supply side, working with investors and financial institutions, as well as on the demand side with, um, with developers and other um, project companies that are looking for funds to get their projects off the ground. Um, and Iwan will talk about that in more detail. So here's a summary of the entire uh, program with the four strands plus one cross-cutting strand at the bottom, gender and in inclusion. I'll go through each of these uh, quickly and talk about the key elements of each of the strands. First of all, on the policy side, we're looking both on-grid and off-grid. On the on-grid side, we're working principally with MEMR but also with the Ministry of Finance that's responsible for subsidies and other fiscal incentives for the development of uh, low carbon energy sources. There's a lot, as you know, um, coming from MEMR, uh, you may have heard about the draft uh, presidential regulation that is under preparation to revise 
the regulatory basis for uh, renewable development in Indonesia. And of course, we'll be assisting them with the preparation and implementation of the subsidiary regulations to that purpose. Demonstrating some of the different models for off-grid supply and also um, preparing a, regula a regulatory framework to support private sector involvement in off-grid. And finally, because uh, PLN has such a dominant position in the sector, we have to make sure that they're in a position to actually implement these new policies and regulations. So we'll be working also very closely with PLN uh, to strengthen their implementation ability. On the brokerage strand, as I mentioned, we're looking at both supply side and demand side assistance. Um, and I'll leave it more to Iwan to go into detail about uh, what our brokerage activities entail. The demonstration projects, as I mentioned, looking principally at uh, two uh, demonstration projects for off-grid supply and how we can bring in uh, private sector participation to deliver better uh, welfare outcomes for uh, rural communities that do, not, that do not yet have the benefit of uh, grid or off-grid supply. And to develop, develop the capacity within local institutions like BUMDES, like B BUMDs, the PEMDAs, in order to administer uh, these programs. Collabor collaboration and networking, as I mentioned, that's around this uh, sharing of experience, sharing the lessons learned both from outside Indonesia as well as within Indonesia. And then finally, uh, gender and inclusion, <laughs> looking at how these programs can uh, improve the empowerment of, William, uh, of women and also to include marginalized or vulnerable uh, groups within society. Um, I guess just before I turn it over to Iwan, a lot of you have probably been in Indonesia uh, quite a while. You've seen programs like this come and go. Um, and I think it's, it's important to look at what's different this time. Uh, what is Mentari doing differently that's going to hopefully achieve greater results than other programs that have come before it. First of all, about the program itself is the duration and the resources that are available under the program. So we are looking at a four year duration, which I think is uh, necessary to try to get uh, anything done, particularly on the policy side. Um, and also the resources that are available. We, we have a very uh, deep and broad uh, group of experts Indonesian as well as foreign. Uh, we are coming with very good pre-existing relationships with our counterparts in government, in the private sector, and in the BOMNs. And so hopefully we can leverage those relationships to make some progress. But I think it's also important to note that we have new people uh, in government, a new minister of MEMR. I mean, it's been uh, six or seven months now, but there's certainly been a big change uh, since the last cabinet and the vision that uh, our new minister has, as well as the Esalon one and down through the rank and file of the government, but also very importantly within PLN. You may be aware of the, uh, the transformational program that PLN is implementing, of which one of the key pillars is really to move to a more sustainable basis. The way the PLN uh, directors that I've spoken to talk about it is, look, we've achieved so much in terms of providing basic supply. Over the last 10 years, rural electrification ratios increased from about 65% up to close to 100%, 98%. Uh, we've been able to go to global bond markets. We've improved the quality of service to people that have supply. But now our stakeholders are demanding that we move into a more sustainable mode of operation. So I, I really sense that from the PLN leadership, there's a real willingness and a, and a vision to the future to uh, move to a more sustainable basis and hopefully to implement and achieve a lot of the objectives of the Mentari program. And then finally, this was something that um, the ambassador alluded to was the COVID situation and how this has created a, a bit of an economic crisis here in Indonesia and around the world. Um, crises provide opportunities for really meaningful change. And for those of you that were here uh, during the Asian financial crisis in the late 90s, um, you saw all of the very positive changes that were stimulated by that crisis, all the banking reforms, 
all of the changes in the regulatory environment here in Indonesia. And so as the ambassador pointed out, this is another probably once or twice in a generation opportunity to develop um, uh, a, a more sustainable basis going forward. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Iwan, who can tell you more about the, um, about the brokerage activities under the Mentari program. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, and uh, good morning and good afternoon for all the participants and all the panelists, and thanks for the great champ for the opportunity for us to share about the Mentari and especially on the brokerage that I'm the lead uh, of the strand. So, uh, the activities of brokerage, uh, as uh, mentioned earlier, that uh, we would like to cover both sides, uh, supply and demands, and look at each of the uh, side, what is the challenge, what is the opportunity, and uh, we are trying to uh, reduce the gap uh, by having a matchmaking uh, between the supply and the demand side. So. Uh, we at this activities would like to uh, have a better picture why the RE development in Indonesia is not going as planned uh, because uh, there's just a perception uh, from somebody who doesn't know about the Indonesian situation it looks like a rather strange that uh, well the, the appetite on the investor is there and the projects, as you know, the RE projects in Indonesia, we have a lot of potential to develop. And then uh, that is Mantari would like to uh, participate, uh, support by the UK government through the FCO Prosperity Fund. Uh, later, I will dis uh, discuss or explain more about what kind of uh, activities that we can, uh, you know, uh, assist uh, both supply and demand side. So, as you know, uh, the financier or the investor look, uh, Indonesia is one of the target for them to invest uh, because the opportunity, uh, we look at the, uh, the potential of RE, there are so many uh, opportunities uh, of RE, including the eastern part of Indonesia. Uh, we said that our focus for Mantari would like to uh, look at the, the eastern part due to uh, the number one is the electricity connection is scattered and not as advanced in the western part as Java or Sumatra, but of course uh, on also to look at the you know the, the economic development that is still behind compared to the rest of the western part of Indonesia. And uh, that is one of the uh, main objective of Bantari. Then uh, we, the opportunity for Bantari can play is uh, to introduce or to have a, a better picture uh, for the financier. What is the opportunity? What is the challenge? And then also we would like to provide some uh, important information about how to invest in Indonesia because not all the investors are familiar with Indonesia, especially with the regulations, it sometimes makes some confusion on, on, on how to invest the RE. And that may be one of the obstacles that uh, the investor would like, uh, you know, rather hesitate uh, to uh, invest in Indonesia. And on the demand side, well, that is uh, basically we notice that you know for the small scale RE renewable energy in Indonesia, in Eastern Indonesia are a small to medium size of the company. So uh, we notice that not all of them are at funds knowing about the uh, how to make the projects viable or to make project uh, attractive for the investors. They are rather less sophisticated if they stand alone, uh, small to medium-sized company who doesn't really know about the uh, RE business in Indonesia. But some of them are belong to the big group who uh, has a, a better access on finance. They know how to make a good 
business model and how to make uh, the projects happen. The challenge are basically, you know, uh, the PPA itself or the on-grid things, uh, we have a numbers of PPA for renewable energy uh, sign uh, with PLN, uh, but uh, you can imagine is how many percent of them has going through until the COD or how, until the project is completed. Uh, because they realize also by having the PPA, it seems that the finance is there, but in fact, it's, it's not that easy or not that straight. And the second one is on low, also on the tariff itself, because now the government is, you know, uh, tied up, uh, the, tightening up the, the tariff uh, to the uh, regional production costs, which is quite low, and then they set 85% of the regional. Uh, the other one that makes sometimes the uh, investors look at the, the, the challenge is on the uh, local contents and also the regulation of licensing, permit, land acquisition, something like that. And the most important thing is the developers, uh, the conventional developers I mentioned is their lack of experience to prepare a good business proposal, to prepare a good FS and uh, they have uh, limited access uh, to the investor or to the financiers. So that is the area they would like to, Pentari can play an important role for the next uh, three years. So here is uh, what Pentari can do on, on the gap assessment, because we look at the overall for the past uh, few years, uh, the people say, well, the RE is not that progressing well because it's like a chicken and egg. But we would like to uh, participate in uh, supporting uh, the, the, uh, the project uh, for uh, a quality uh, uh, project that can have a better bankability uh, uh, proposal. So that means that uh, we can come to uh, extend an a TA to say about, uh, you know, to improve uh, the FS and then to make the projects uh, even uh, yeah, attractive for the investors. So based on our observation for the past few months, basically when we uh, try to interview mostly the prospective investor if uh, overseas mostly uh, the investment or the fund is there but how to channel that to the right projects is the main the main obstacles so uh, to make the proposal is more attractive is one of the our our target for the next one uh, uh, because you know the local conventional financiers like uh, local banks or even SMI as a developing banks of Indonesia, uh, they have or they look at the RE project is rather, you know, high risk business or high risk investment. They ask for some collateral. The project financing is not that advanced in Indonesia. Uh, they are more on the uh, conventional uh, corporate finance. So we would like also here to introduce about the you know, innovative financing scheme on the blended financing scheme, uh, how to make the projects uh, can be financed in non-conventional way, something like that. So here is, uh, uh, you know, uh, the project developers would like to play important roles on how to improve that. Uh, they should understanding about the, the market itself they should understand about how to make uh, you know a good proposal, and they would like also to uh, you know uh, have a, a better access on how to make the projects uh, even more attractive. And this is our main obstacles for the next uh, three years that we would like to have a, a better uh, understanding and a system. Uh, uh, to get financed by uh, international investors mostly, 
you can imagine that uh, the appetite of the investors, uh, overseas investors especially, they have various of uh, uh, interests. Some of them are only uh, interested in the uh, lending types of business. Some of them also they said, well, I would like to participate a certain percentage in the in the SPV or in the project's company. And some of them can also uh, combining both by say, providing a mezzanine loan or something like that. So we would like to blend that uh, uh, all the potential of the investors now sitting nicely overseas Indonesia. Hopefully with the COVID is doesn't, you know, really hit about the appetite. But in the next three, four years, I believe uh, the investors appetite still look at the uh, Indonesian uh, opportunity is still challenging and still attractive. So at the same time, we also would like to improve the, 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 the developer's quality in terms of proposal, uh, in terms of uh, bankability. And that's why we are uh, coming uh, to the eastern part of Indonesia, which is uh, mostly a small scale uh, size of RE development. Uh, this is the activities that I mentioned earlier that uh, we have uh, three different groups activities. Uh, the first group, basically, we are almost finalized for the, for the first six months of the program. We have, uh, even though with the COVID uh, work from home mostly, we cannot directly contact with the prospective investor or developer, but we, thanks to the technology, we can still manage about more than 30 companies already in our pipeline. And then uh, that will be updated every six months to look at any opportunity will become up in the next uh, three years. And then uh, we are now preparing on the second activities that we would like to uh, implement uh, on the second half of this year for the brokerage uh, or TA services that we can extend now we have already signed a couple of NDA uh, with the prospective developer and financier to look at, uh, you know, the opportunity we can go through uh, on extending uh, which projects uh, we can, uh, you know, assist them on the TA or improve uh, proposal, whatever they need to have uh, uh, more attractive for the investors. So. That is what uh, we are doing for the next one year. And then the last uh, activity is, uh, of course, financing is the key. As you mentioned earlier, that uh, financing is not the main problem, but we should clear enough that the investment in RE in Indonesia will result as a showcase that, look, we can proceed with the nice with, the, uh, with the, a good uh, proposal, and then we can uh, a matchmaking between the investor and the developer with a quality uh, proposal and quality, uh, say, sponsors and everything, then hopefully we can uh, close the deal uh, with any kind of, uh, you know, uh, deals that uh, the investor would like either lending or investing as, a, as a equity partners. So this is the three main activities that we are going uh, updating every six months and keep going until end of 2023. Uh, that is uh, the progress. I think I just, uh, yeah, I can share the presentation later on about the delivery partners as I mentioned earlier uh, by Mike and uh, Jonathan and also uh, the ambassador about this. I think uh, back to you, uh, Pak Jonathan. Thank you so much, uh, Pak Mike and Pak Iwan. We have already a list of questions actually from the audience. Uh, perhaps quickly to start with one. Uh, there were questions about what is included under the program, whether uh, residential rooftop uh, solar project is included and whether bioenergy is included. Perhaps uh, Pak Iwan, you would like to answer this first question. Uh, yes, thanks, Pak Jonathan. Uh, unfortunately, for residents, a rooftop is not covering by our services because residential rooftop is basically, uh, you know, uh, 
not having the main objective of the Mentari, like uh, reduce poverty and then uh, you know increase the inclusive uh, uh, market or economic development. So, but uh, keep in mind that uh, for the rooftop, for commercial purposes, sort of like uh, a rooftop in the rural areas to support the supply the electricity for say cold storage, it might consider us uh, to to have that. And the second one on bioenergy, yes, uh, bioenergy we should have to know what kind of energy. I mean, a uh, biomass types. If it links with, uh, sorry to say about uh, the oil palm or palm oil, that would be out of uh, our focus for today, uh, because you know palm oil is rather sensitive, and then we would like to have a better clean, uh, and then again that the the objective of uh, reducing poverty and then uh, uh, increase uh, the economic development is not there. Okay, thank you, uh, Pak Iwan. Uh, another question from uh, Lee Cheng, SMEC International. Uh, what is Indonesia's government genuine commitment to renewable and what policy in place to support the rollout? So this is a, an industrial question and probably part of why Mentari program is, is here. Uh, probably briefly, Mike, you would like to give your insights on, on more on the Indonesian government commitment for renewable? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I think that the first and foremost uh, in indication of government commitment and how that's changed is this uh, new presidential regulation that's under preparation. Um, it was supposed to be released earlier this year, but then with COVID, uh, it sort of took a second priority uh, but we do expect it to be released sometime within the next month or so. Uh, and, and that will overcome a lot of the problems that we saw in the previous regulatory regime. Of course, it's just a start. Uh, you need to get all the implementing regulations in place, at uh, specifically the, the permen. Uh, and then you need to make sure that those can be implemented properly. And, and that goes back to the point I raised earlier about working with PLN and with others, but but I think that's that that's sort of where the uh, where the rubber meets the road. I mean, let, let's see what comes out in that new uh, perpres. Um, they're moving back towards a the indications at least are that they're moving back to a feed-in tariff regime for certain classes of projects and a reverse auction regime regime for other classes of projects. Um, and that there is a presidential uh, directive for agencies, ministries across that, that, that have, as you probably know, PLN, the power sector is subject to, I'd like to say, regulation, control, uh, directives from a number of different uh, agencies. And, and so this and one of the things this presidential regulation will do is begin to identify who needs to do what. Uh, and, and hopefully that will help overcome some of these interagency problems that we have seen in the past. So I'd say t stay tuned for that. And then hopefully if we have another call in, uh, you know, three or six months, we can report some real progress. But I'd say that's that's right. the first thing to, to, uh, to look for. Uh, do you have anything, uh, Iwan, that you'd like to um, add to that? Yeah, basically is uh, what Mike said is true that uh, <clears throat> the government relies about uh, the previous policy are basically not consistent and makes uh, hurdles for the RE. Uh, in terms of, uh, for instance, tariff, uh, local contents, and then also, you know, transparency, something. So we hope that uh, by having this uh, new purpose or new uh, decree, we'll, uh, we'll bridge that. But on top of that, I think government also has already, uh, you know, provides some more incentive, for instance, like a fiscal policy, income tax, import duty, VAT exemption. And especially for geothermal, for instance, they have extended uh, so many incentives for the geothermal. Uh, 
and then we also uh, have experience for the PPP, public partner private ship, that uh, can be applied in the RE uh, by providing the sort of like a guarantee uh, letters uh, from the government's uh, order the developers. Okay, thank you, uh, Pai Wan. I hope uh, that helps to answer and uh, just to nicely follow on uh, to that. Uh, Mike mentioned about PLN as well, and there's a question from uh, Ananda Setion, Setion Ifananto, A-Wing Group. Uh, what specific objective uh, you want to achieve in the end to mentari specifically for PLN? Because we know that PLN have some issues probably in terms of uh, finance and probably technical and policy agility as well. Perhaps uh, Mike and Pak Iwa would like to address this. Yeah, um, thanks Jonathan. Yeah, I, I saw Ivan's question there. And I thought, well, yeah, that, that, that kind of sums up the problems that PLN faces. Uh, huge liquidity problem, uh, technical issues in terms of their ability to change the way they plan and operate the system. Um, and then finally, the fact that they have multiple masters that are all uh, asking different things from them that are sometimes, maybe more often than not, in fact, in conflict with one another. Um, so let me sort of address those one by one. Um, on, on the liquidity issue, it's, uh, my view on that is it's, it's like the whole COVID situation. Um, PLN faces the worst financial situation it has faced since uh, Chris Mon, since 20 years ago. Um, and that is motivating change there. It's, it's, it's causing them to look at new ways of doing things. Um, and I think the fact that we have a new board in place that is one of the best boards I've seen in years, that I really sense in talking to them that they are actually committed to this. Um, I, I, I think that's, despite the liquidity problems, I think they have the right vision and the right commitment. Um, specifically about the liquidity issue though, I mean, they are looking at new ways of financing. So. PLN right now is um, just, we've been helping them work on a sustainable financing framework. They had hoped to go to the market for about a 500 billion US dollar green bond later this year. Um, that will probably be delayed just because of the liquidity issue, COVID, everything else. But they will be releasing that document probably within the next month or so. That'll give you, uh, it's a statement of intent that we worked with them on. And I think that will give you a better picture of where they're going with this. And certainly, uh, if you know about green bonds, if they do go to the market with a green bond, they are going to be committed to spending that for eligible projects. And, and you're gonna see that, you know, this really does, uh, I, I think, impose the discipline on them to take a more uh, sustainable path. With respect to technical issues, you know, let's start with the regulation first. Uh, you know, we got to make sure that there's good, sound regulations in place. I mean, you're, you're probably aware uh, PLN has taken a very conservative, overly conservative approach towards uh, penetration levels of variable renewable energy. Um, okay, so let's let's start by adjusting and 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 improving the regulatory environment, and then let's work with them uh, to enhance their capability to implement new ways of doing things. So that's very much within the scope of Mentari. And again, when you combine that with the leadership changes we see, I'm very confident that we can, we can get some traction on this. Finally, about the problem of PLN having multiple masters, um, it's a huge issue and, and it's a bigger problem than just Mentari. Um, you know, I think uh, it, it's, it's really a sector-wide regulatory and policy issue. But I think we're seeing some progress there. I understand that there's a memorandum of understanding between the Esalon one in Kementerian uh, BOMN, in, uh, in uh, Ministry of Finance, and in uh, MEMR, um, so that they do not make decisions without consulting the other. And hopefully this, can, this is the first step towards beginning to give PLN a set of targets that are internally consistent. So you don't have, um, you know, MOF saying, okay, minimize uh, subsidy payouts, and you have uh, MEMR saying, 
you know, uh, we want you to achieve universal access and we want you to achieve 23% renewable uh, penetration or mix within your energy mix. So by getting these ministries to start talking together, hopefully we can come up with a coherent set of, uh, of consistent objectives for PLN operations. All right. Okay, thank you, uh, Mike, for the uh, answer. Hope that helps uh, to guide us towards uh, what we can do with PLN. Of course, this program will uh, will work with PLN as well. And uh, we have to. We are running slightly over time, and we we'll have to end soon. Let me just answer a few quick questions uh, from Neil Carmichael whether LNG is included into the scope. Uh, unfortunately, not. We'll focus on renewable as well, and from Julian Taylor whether uh, do we envisage a role for UK universities in this program. Yes, it is under the collaboration uh, strand, which is we will work with universities as well and do contact us on that. And uh, perhaps the last question, a practical one from Pak Yan Tosyan Faraba, whether our program will be able to help with uh, expediting permits faster. Uh, perhaps Pak Yuan, you would like to. To, uh, to answer that. Well, yes. Uh, thank you for the question. And uh, from Payanto Sianipar, he was with the uh, Chevron uh, geothermal before. So yes, yeah, especially for geothermal licensing was one of the nightmare license that we have to get uh, things. But uh, we, uh, we have a policy strand also would like to uh, provide some inputs to the governments, uh, to uh, either the central governments or even uh, in the uh, local government uh, to relaxing or to make some of the, the licensing. We cannot guarantee it can be faster, but at least by endorsed by the Mantari would like to, you know, make the projects uh, can go faster or at least they are not blocking the license due to one to another reasons. Uh, I hope and I believe with the UK uh, seriousness, UK government seriousness shows to the local government uh, or the central government that we would like to unlock uh, the bottlenecks of uh, licensing. Uh, but if we would like to leave it as we are not the agency who can do the, the make the license uh, easier or faster, but we can assist on that way of uh, on the license and permits. Okay, thank you, Pai Wan. That brings us to the end of uh, our session today. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining. I would like to re-emphasize again that uh, we would like to discuss further with uh, all of you. There is uh, more questions than uh, I can mention today, and uh, our context is actually uh, displayed in the end of the slides that uh, were presented. So do get in touch with us. We would like to talk more uh, if you have projects in Eastern Indonesia, if you are interested to invest in renewable energy projects, do get in touch with us and we will be very open to discuss about it. Uh, if you have any questions for uh, us as well, UK government, please do uh, provide, get in touch with us and provide us your questions. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Before we end, let me just share something that we will be uh, doing next week, which is another uh, webinar on waste to energy. I saw some questions on waste to energy, so let me bring your attention to this. Uh, DIT Jakarta is having a waste to management and waste to energy webinar next week, 15th of July, uh, 9 to 10 30 a.m. GMT or 3 to 4 30 p.m. Uh, Jakarta. So the contact to RSPP is uh, Reza Prasetyo at fco.gov.uk. My colleagues in the IT. Uh, one of the highlights will be Pak Yudi Prabangkara from uh, Ministry of uh, Maritime Affairs and Investment, uh, which will talk about the 12 municipal waste to energy projects and how is it progressing in, in the midst of uh, COVID 19 as well. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for your uh, attention today and for your participation. Uh, thank you, Pak Mike and Pak Iwan, for your time today and present to us the program. Pak Mike and Pak Iwan, contacts is in the slides. 
please do, do get in touch with us. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Have a good afternoon, have a good morning. Take care and see you again. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks all.